Okay, good evening. Um, welcome to the ANU. My name is Mark Matthews. I'm the kind of um, in the departure lounge as executive director of the H.C. Coombs Policy Forum, which is the think tank within the Australian National, National Institute for Public Policy. Um, so this will probably be the last time I introduce the speaker, which I'll, I'll miss. Um, but um, before I say anything else, I'd just like to express my um, respect to the normal people in this Amber meeting today. And um, Look, it gives me really great pleasure to have Dan Finover from the UK. Uh, not least, we just discovered we went to war in schools in North London where we used to find, well, we didn't used to beat each other up. His school used to beat my school up. Um, <laughs> tough North London. Um, and um, Dan, I'm really looking forward to this talk. I think it's going to be absolutely fascinating. And Doc, Dan's here, he's been in uh, Melbourne last week and with us this week, an incredibly hectic schedule. So um, we're very grateful for that. Um, so, Dan is Professor of Social Inclusion at the University of Portsmouth and he was previously co-director of the Independent Unemployment Unit um, and he's really got this amazing track record in looking at um, employment support, outsourcing of public employment services, um, various aspects of welfare. Um, so I think it's going to be a really timely and interesting talk. The specific thing Dan's going to talk about is um, really lessons for Australian policymakers from his experience of welfare to work in, if you like, in tough economic times. Um, looking at wider developments in OECD countries and in particular looking at some of the developments in the UK, um, some sort of radical reform processes going on there which I think are be quite interesting. Um, so really, um, without saying any more, I'll just hand over to Dan. I think we just had a quick discussion. Um, I would have, we, it, ideally if you've got questions of clarification over data or points, We'd like to get, do that as we go through, but because we've got recording the roving mics, it might be better to send save all those things to the end because and wait for the mic before we do that. So we'll just do about 40 minutes down and then we'll take questions. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thanks for that. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge the fact that I'm continuing a kind of long tradition between of connections between Portsmouth and Australia because we were where the first fleet went from. And, uh, <laughs> uh, look at what we create, but there we go. <laughs> uh, okay, um, th 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 this is a kind of formal kind of academic lecture. I'm much more used to kind of talking in policy, kind of oriented circles and to practitioners and uh, public servants. And so I thought I'd nod in the right direction of the academic world and the first couple of pages I've actually done formally, right? And then I'm gonna relax a bit and um, get into the uh, the less formal part of what, uh, what I want to talk about. And I, I thought it was quite interesting to try and frame what I want to say a bit, bit more kind of tightly than I maybe would do in a, a, in a more, poly, a, a more practitioner-oriented kind of environment. So the first thing I want to kind of acknowledge is the fact that when I left the UK last week, uh, the, the latest unemployment figures had just been announced. And our upward trend is continuing. We're now over 8% unemployment and the number of claimant unemployed, which is the people claiming the equivalent of the New Start allowance, our job seekers allowance, is uh, now about 1.6 million people, which is starting to edge back to the bad old days of the 80s for us. Um, as in previous recessions, what's happening is that the group that are getting in the neck first are young people, um, but what we're also starting to see is an increase in durations of unemployment, and that's really serious because in tough economic times, when you get increases in durations, that's when you're likely to get that kind of awful economic, e economist language of history says you get kind of almost permanent disconnection from the labour market, and it's something that's very, very difficult to unwind. British economic projections, like most of uh, the OECD published uh, another set today, uh, are all kind of trending downwards, and even the kind of pessimistic uh, projections that we were getting uh, towards the end of last year have been revised significantly downwards over the kind of period. And even if we avoid a recession, which with a bit of luck in the UK we might, uh, we're not going to be recovering. All the projections are that we won't even get back to the employment levels pre the recession uh, before 2015, 2016. So this is, we're going to be doing it tough in the UK over that period. Fortunately, however, we're not. Uh, Europe, <laughs> uh, and Southern Europe is really grim at the moment. Uh, you know, you're talking about places like Greece and uh, Spain with unemployment rates of hitting 20% now, youth unemployment hitting 40%, uh, 
And the latest data, data I was looking at today showed that in Europe, over 40% of the unemployed have now been out of work for over a year. So this is starting to shift into structural unemployment rather than the frictional kind of unemployment we've been used to in Europe and in many other OECD countries over the last decade. Uh, fortunately, Australia seems to be avoiding that cycle for now. You know, unfortunately, these things, we're in a global world. These things will have effects here. Okay, um, my, I'm quite pessimistic about the future because if the prognosis, if the solution to our problems is austerity measures, which seems to be the way things are going, then when you suck that much demand out of economies, the future for unemployment is not good, and the future for employment isn't good. Now, crucially, macroeconomic policies are going to make, make or break the levels of employment in both the UK and in other OECD countries, and particularly in kind of Europe. But what we do know from the earlier periods is that bad policy decisions now, in responding to the uh, increase in unemployment, can take a long, long time one mind. And what we know is that the design and delivery of benefit systems can play a critical role in shaping how long unemployment lasts and how long increased welfare dependency actually lasts. And what we know from the last two recessions is that there's a risk that policies implemented to tackle the immediate consequences of unemployment uh, may have actually exacerbated long-term kind of uh, difficult and uh, uh, the kind of trends that we don't want to see. In, crucially, the kind of the nub of it is that the, uh, the policy decisions in the 1980s and early 1990s exacerbated the persistence of long-term unemployment and continued to increase economic inactivity, especially amongst the large numbers of working age people who now receive disability benefits, amongst older workers who took early retirement and to a lesser extent amongst our parents. And those are exactly the kinds of things that many people here in uh, various departments and that many people like yourselves in, uh, in the UK and in other European countries have been trying to unwind uh, over the last 10 years. Um, so what I want to do is to critically review the kind of progress that was made uh, in the UK in particular over the last uh, decade and to consider the kind of reforms the New Labour introduced, some of the effects they had and crucially, also, how well we managed the 2008-2009 the recession. Doesn't mean we're going to manage the, uh, the future kind of scenarios as well, but uh, I think we went into this recession much better prepared than we were in the early 90s and early 1980s. I then want to talk about the fundamental changes, some of its continuity, some of its radical change, that are coming through from the new coalition government in the United Kingdom. Uh, and in a nutshell, there are two kind of big changes taking place. From 2013, we're going to be moving towards a single working age benefit. Uh, this is an, a major exercise that will affect 9 million people, uh, 9 million people and families in the United Kingdom, and will be implemented between 2013 and 2017 with consequential effects after that. So we're talking about the shape of our benefit system over the next decade at least, if not longer than that. The second kind of change is a, a, a pretty dramatic change in the way that we contract with employment service providers to actually engage with people on benefits and to reduce kind of welfare dependency. Um, from this year, we've contracted out with 18 prime providers a, a, a new contracting mechanism which basically is saying to those prime providers, you will only get paid if you get people in work and we will pay you from future benefit savings. It's a radical different and a very different way to the Australian system in contracting uh, out those kinds of services and whilst it's, I, I have no kind of um, brief in terms of saying it's a better way or anything like that, it is a benchmark against which you can now compare how you're going to be looking at the future of the JSA system here as you go forward over, uh, over the next uh, period. Okay, so um, look, obviously we've got to keep in mind the big differences between the countries but I think the useful thing about looking at a country like the UK is there are some commonalities we both benchmark against each other and there are things to be learned. Not that you slavishly kind of follow them, uh, but they actually kind of uh, act as a kind of template which you can then look at what you're doing and how you're actually kind of progressing. And what I want to try and do at the end is just suggest some kind of key points to me that I think they, the British developments and the way that we've been approaching welfare reform throw up. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I was just thinking about the... Uh, 
I'm in Mackenzie then for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, that um, you know, bring in sharp relief some of the kind of policy choices and decisions that maybe you need to be thinking about in Australia, that you are thinking about, frankly. Okay. The first thing is that we use language slightly differently. Um, in Australia, the, 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 the language is one of participation, right, of actually increasing the number of people in employment, but also with a, a slight tinge of social inclusion, that employment is one of the key vehicles for getting people there. Um, in Europe and more widely in the OECD, the language we use is the language of activation policies. But again, they're very much about dealing with the same kinds of issues. We've got aging populations, we've got long-term technological and employment shifts taking place. We need to increase the participation rates, uh, the economic participation rates of working class, sorry, working class, working age uh, people uh, to meet the kind of challenges thrown up by those long-term changes. What recession does is quite often accelerate the pace of some of that changes, but it doesn't change the fundamentals. You know? So participation or activation in the European and OECD sense is how do we actually get our working age populations more engaged with work, into employment, and becoming taxpayers rather than benefit receivers. The initial focus uh, was on the distinction between passive benefits and active labour market programs. If you go back to the early 1980s, that was the contrast that was being made, and the implicit assumption was we need to shift from uh, investing so much in unemployment benefits, early retirement, and things like that, into labour market programmes like training programmes, etc., etc. I think there are now a significant group of OECD countries where what we're seeing is more comprehensive and systemic reforms. Right? And that second wave is not just about increased benefit conditionality or about the use of particular labour market programmes. It's about the design, sequencing and effectiveness of those interventions on the one hand in activated service delivery systems on the other. So it's a double activation that's taking place. There's an activation of benefits and the treatments that people receive when they're on benefits, but an activation of the service delivery mechanisms, the centre links, the uh, Job Services Australia kind of providers or the Job Centre Plus <coughs> in the UK or the German BA, the much more fundamental reform. So it's this combination of public sector reform, the welfare state, and interacting with the labour market. And it's this systemic kind of approach that I think is uh, really important. And what's happened is that initially these programmes and these initiatives were targeted at the young and long-term unemployed. But over the last uh, four to five years in particular, we've seen them extended in the Anglo countries, particularly to sole parents but also increasingly to people on disability benefits. What we found uh, three, four years ago, and the OECD has done a lot of really important work around this, is that quite typically in Northern and Western European countries, we had more people of working age on disability benefits than we did on regular job seeking benefits. And that was a really difficult problem to start to unwind. And I'll talk about the ways in which the UK has tried to, to do that. Activation reforms, there's no consensus about them. These are disputed, you know, even if you think we should be going down this route, if, you know, some people, um, some of my academic colleagues will talk about, you know, creating a reserve army of labour and, the, you know, forcing people into low paid work, etc., etc. But even with, if you accept the kind of, the, you know, welfare states need to be modernised, people need to be activated, we need to be re-engaging people with work, there are big disputes about how you actually go about doing that. The two big ones are, from my point of view, on the one hand, should these programmes be mandatory or should they be voluntary? And the second big dispute is, should they be about employment first, work first, should we simply be trying to attach people into the labour market, or should we be building up their human capital before we try to attach them to the labour market? And those, you know, there are various permutations about where individual systems end up on those kind of gradations. Scandinavian countries tend to be much more about human capital development. The Anglo countries have tended to opt for the employment first type of approach, or the work first type of approach. So what did New Labour try to do? Well, the first thing is it was the first self-conscious welfare-to-work government. Uh, within weeks of taking office in 1997, it passed a, an emergency budget, which was called the Welfare-to-Work Budget, and the whole kind of construction of New Labour was around one of its key purposes was to reform the welfare state. Not to get rid of it, but to actually re-legitimise it and make it per fit for purpose for where we were in the late 1990s. Uh, it was the only thing that had new resources attached to it. 
uh, New Labour to get elected committed itself to an austerity programme inherited from the previous government, but it decided to tax a bunch of very uh, unpopular people uh, called the privatised utilities who were making super profits at the time. And with that £5 billion, we actually invested a lot of money into welfare to work programmes, particularly for the young unemployed, but more widely after that. And the bank has come in mind as a useful target for a second welfare windfall <laughs> tax uh, in the future, but we'll leave that to another moment. Okay. Uh, Labour came into all kinds of political strife, but one of the key things I think about why New Labour was able to kind of drive its reform agenda in a way that uh, the previous Conservative administration hadn't been able to experience a lot of opposition, was it wasn't just about reducing the number of people on welfare. It was also very much from 1999 uh, about the parallel commitment to end child poverty. Um, and this wasn't a Bob Hawke commitment to end child poverty, which <laughs> never, never kind of got realised. This was a serious commitment, and you know, that would be another kind of lecture in terms of how they actually went about achieving that. But it was a combination both of tax and benefit reform on the one hand, but also about increasing the employment rate of uh, workless households, in particular the employment rate of sole families, uh, sole parent families. Alongside that core theme of welfare reform, there are a number of parallel kind of developments one of which was a concern about social exclusion and a concern about those concentrated areas of deprivation and social exclusion, which weren't just, you know, you can't just have blanket policies, you need targeted neighbourhood type policies. And this came from the work of the Social Exclusion Unit. There was also a set of reforms to public sector institutions about how we modernise them, how we actually get them fit for purpose to deliver the type of active self welfare state that we wanted. And also there was a commitment to evidence-based policy making. Um, that is, you shouldn't just do things because you instinctively think they're the right things to do. You should somehow test what they are and then do what it is you've decided to do in the first place anyways. But now you've got kind of some legitimacy <laughs> for what you're actually doing. I prefer to use the phrase uh, evidence-informed social policy rather than evidence-based. Uh, evidence okay, a number of things. And again, I don't want to go too, too much into them. But what comes out of this period are a number of innovations, right? Uh, these aren't, you know, these aren't, you know, start in eureka moments, but they're really important things in terms of how you reorganise and redefine delivery systems. We created these New Deal employment programmes. We looked at working nation as one of the examples about things we should learn from. So one of the first things we did, yes, we had a job guarantee for long-term unemployed people, but we said the emphasis should be on getting people into unsubsidised jobs rather than into programmes. And that was, for those of you with long enough kind of memories, one of the problems with Working Nation was that there was as much emphasis on getting people into programmes as there wasn't actually getting them into jobs. So we create what we call the gateway period before you then use more intensive uh, employment and training programmes for people who couldn't be placed into unsubsidised jobs. The key uh, thing we decided, uh, defined was to change the role of the frontline workers working with long term unemployed people in particular, and we started to develop what we described as personal advisors. In other systems, they would be called case managers, as they were here uh, during that period. Now I think they're called recruitment consultants, uh, and maybe they don't do quite the same job. Alongside the New Deal programmes, there's a whole set of things around making work pay. This is a really important part of the UK system, not immediately transferable into an Australian system with your award system and the complexities of how your family tax benefit system works. But the key message was, we need a floor out there, which is the national minimum wage. We didn't have one previous to that. But we used an extensive tax credit system <coughs> to make work pay. So the national minimum wage meant there was an equity. Everybody got, got a fair go in terms of the, way, the minimum wage they were entitled to. But on top of that, we had tax credits which were sensitive to family circumstances. So you could target resources, particularly at those um, children who would otherwise be in, in families in poverty. Uh, by the time New Labour leaves office, over 16% of working families, working age families, in, sorry, working families in the United Kingdom are having their income supplemented through the tax credit system in one way or the other. The other crucial thing about this, and this is one of the things that will change in the British system, but the crucial thing about the policy decision that was made is that when you move into the tax credit system, at the minimum 16 hours work a week, you become a taxpayer, not a welfare dependent, uh, a welfare client. So you can have whatever savings you want, you're not means tested in the same kind of way, and it was constructed as 
this was a real marked change in your kind of status. A dilemma was, of course, that whole bunch of people who were working under 16 hours a week who stayed in the means-tested welfare system. Make work possible, you can make work pay, you can have new deal employment programs, but if you're not creating a working environment where people with childcare responsibilities, other care responsibilities, or with limited health uh, opportunities can actually uh, work, then you know it's not going to work. So there's a whole set of other policies around family friendly working environments, about anti discrimination legislation, which are geared to actually make work possible as well as make work pay. And then in terms of the service delivery side, we made a very different decision to the Australian system. Uh, and Australia, again, is an outlier in this, partly because of the way you've contracted out employment services, which is in most other systems, what you see taking place is an integration of benefit administration and employment systems, rather than their complete distinction, as happens in the Australian system. Uh, the, what, the form of that in the United Kingdom was the creation of an agency called Job Centre Plus, which in many respects, if you go into a Job Centre Plus office, it looks fairly similar to a Centrelink office. The diff difference is that it's, its work is about getting people into work, not about paying benefits. As much as possible, that's dealt with through call centres and behind the scenes and the wiring of the system, not in terms of the frontline relationship between uh, uh, claimants and the, uh, and the welfare system. And the other thing which I just want to put out there is that a really important innovation, very simple kind of idea, but incredibly difficult to get up in practice, was the idea of compulsory work-focused interviews. So we weren't going to force loan parents or people on disability benefits into jobs. They weren't job seekers. They were different to that. But from 1999, uh, when the legislation went through in Parliament, it became possible to require people to attend an interview, and if they didn't attend, talk about their employment circumstances, any barriers they might have, an action plan about how they might think about their future, um, that um, uh, they would be subject to a fairly mild benefit kind of penalty. And that changed things because what it meant was that the relationship between your whole working age claimant population was a more active one with the system. And so it's a really useful kind of instrument. It's not quite the same as saying people got to search for work and be available for more and immediately take any job that's available, but it's an intermediate kind of step. And finally, the thing we did was contestability. We looked at the Australian job network, and we created a thing called employment zones, which we used to experiment with using private sector contractors, third sector, for-profit contractors, to deliver employment services, paying them for outcomes rather than for processes. OK, so progress. Unemployment, not just due to clearly to welfare reforms, but unemployment falls continuously from 1993, uh, with long-term unemployment following, uh, and following more quickly than it did in the 1980s recession, partly to do with the welfare reforms that we experienced. Difficulty was, of course, because we had a work-first strategy, we saw the emergence of what, in the jargon, became repeaters and recyclers. People who were, got into jobs fairly quickly, but didn't stick in those jobs for very long. This is particularly the case of many sole parents. Yeah? Uh, we were very good at getting them into jobs very quickly, but they fell out of jobs at twice the rate of normal, um, the normal JSA population. And that was clearly things to do with the nature of childcare, etc., etc., etc. The increase in the sole parent rate uh, was up by 7%, but falling short of the rate we needed for the 70% target. Uh, just out of interest, the increase in the sole parent employment rate Sorry, we say loan parents, you say sole parents. Uh, so I wobble between the two kind of thing. Uh, but in sole parents, uh, the sole parent employment rate, uh, the econometric analysis that's been done of it attributes nearly half of the increase in the employment rate to policy change. Uh, over half to labour market, increase in labour market demand, etc., etc. But half of it attributable, or nearly half of it attributable to policy change. Child poverty was down, but not at the rate needed to reach the target. Um, the inflow into disability benefit, we focus very much on the gatekeeping, the entry into the disability system, which is where Australian policy is focused on at the moment, from what I see of it. Um, but the caseload continues to rise, uh, and that's largely to do with the fact that people are staying on that benefit for much longer. Um, in 2003, the average duration on our disability benefits was nine years. You know, and I think you've got similar kind of statistics that say, you know, 
you're more likely to die than to come off disability benefit and get a job and things like that. And that just gives you, this is the data up until 2005. The bottom line is the number of young parents and you can see our tax credits, the work focused interviews, the focus on lone parents starts to have an effect. The uh, unemployment, uh, these are the uh, unemployed people claiming job seekers allowance, so the ones on benefit, it's a bit more complicated than that in reality, but those, those on benefit, you can see following the cyclical pattern of the cycles, but that's our big problem. And I, I think, frankly, although the, uh, the pattern might be slightly different, if uh, somebody from the Australian Department was standing up here giving a kind of timeline of benefit receipt over that period, it wouldn't look that dissimilar. Your DSP total would be going up whilst your unemployment total was coming down. In the meantime, we're committed to lots of evidence-based uh, policy. We spend a hell of a, oh sorry, we spend. It's not possessive, right? They spend, right? Um, <laughs> but I find myself being very English or British, rather. Um, <laughs> in this kind of context. So the department spent a hell of a lot of money on evaluations, not just within DWP, but more widely than this, um, and tested lots of things. Yeah? We actually had loads of pilots, pathfinders, because we genuinely didn't know whether a lot of the things would work. Okay, work focused interviews, but from what pattern? With what kind of service offering together? Let's try one in one kind of area, compare it with another, and do a proper evaluation about what seems to work more effectively. And what we start to build up is a, a repository of evidence, which alongside the evidence coming from places like the United States and from the northern and western European countries where evaluations are starting to get better in quality and, uh, and scale over this period is, what we find is that uh, a mandatory job search uh, pays for itself, um, services and sanctions as many people kind of call it. Uh, large scale training and temporary employment programs are pretty ineffective. Uh, they're usually ineffective because you introduce them during a recession when it's really tough to get people in jobs. They have another purpose uh, other than simply getting people in jobs. But what we learned also is that focused, targeted training and employment programs were capable of generating real net impacts over and above what would be happening in the labour market and paying for themselves over the longer term. Um, the other thing is that uh, whilst job search support worked, it needs to be integrated with more expensive things. So you couldn't take from the evidence the conclusion that all we need to do is provide job search and sanctions, and that would uh, fit, fit, fit the bill. What you needed to do was, again, to create a system where the more intensive and more expensive forms of support came at a later stage. You focused initially on job search and job placement. The other thing we found was the lack of flexibility in program design and service delivery was limiting impacts and also departmental silos were preventing joining up at a local level. This probably sounds very familiar to many of you in terms of issues uh, delivering um, things here. We also found that voluntary programs for lone parents and those in disability benefits were working. They were, they were definitely increasing offloads from benefit, increasing the number of people going into jobs, but at a very small scale. Um, and the problem was they weren't reaching the people who were inactive. And the difficulty about the people, sole parents, and particularly people on disability benefits, is they were inactive. That was a starting point for it. And this is just lifted from, um, we have a thing called the Labour Force Survey. It kind of basically is kind of an investigation of, you know, it's equivalents of the uh, household survey that's done in Australia. But what you see in these groups is, whatever you think about it, if people are inactive, they're not going to look get in touch with labour markets. Yeah. Um, so there's plenty of research showing that 90% of people going into disability benefits or health problems want to see themselves as returning to work, want to go back into work in the future, but within six months, within a year, they're into long-term cycles of being on kind of benefit. So our starting point was, again, work-focused interviews. If people aren't in touch with employment, then how, why are we so surprised that very few of them actually get a job? So, second wave of reform, uh, and the first thing is, this is the Halcyon days, they seem a long time ago now, but only about seven or eight years ago, when we envisaged where we could move towards full employment, uh, by which we were talking about an 80% employment rate. Scandinavian countries, the Netherlands, countries like the UK were starting to talk in those terms. At this point, we probably had a 73% employment rate from about 2000, and we've been bobbling along, just inching up gradually, in relationship to that. We're now down to about 70%. Um, 
We also had a whole process of experimentation with new approaches targeted at people on disability benefits and at sole parents. And then really started to bite the bullets. Okay, uh, public <coughs> opinion has been softened up. Uh, sorry, uh, we were working with the grain of public opinion in terms of their attitudes to the kind of benefit systems. And you know, a new kind of social contract, a new social consensus was emerging that um, maybe it wasn't such a bright idea <coughs> that sole parents should uh, not have any work requirements until the youngest child was 16, at which point we bumped them onto a job seeking allowance on which they stayed for another 15 years because they were never actually connected with work in the first place. Maybe that wasn't such a good idea. Maybe they weren't acting as good role models. Maybe there was a culture of dependency. But crucially also, uh, we started to move to think start differently about the disability benefits. And again, I think this is a, a marked difference to the Australian uh, situation. In Australia, as I can see it, uh, what's happening is that you're changing the rules of access to DSP, right? They're keeping the fundamentals of the benefit system as they are. It's just that the people in, you know, you're shifting the balance back that way, particularly in terms of the flow coming into the system. In the UK, there's been a, a rethinking of what that benefit is about in itself. And so our incapacity benefit is now being replaced by a thing we call the Employment Support Allowance. Okay. So again, the name says a lot. You know, we shifted from unemployment benefit to job seekers allowance. You get it because you're a job seeker, not because you're unemployed. In the same way as the original impetus behind New Start, I think you actually had a job search allowance at one point before New Start started at one year unemployed. Equally with disability benefits, now it's a, an employment support allowance, not a disability benefit. And we then, in 2010, so initially, uh, because these things are, you know, these are big system kind of changes, it takes a long time to kind of re-gear systems and re-engineer systems to do this. Um, we initially focused on the flow into the benefits, similar to what you're doing with DSP. But then the kind of consensus built up that we had to be more radical than this, and now uh, from 2011 it was committed to by the previous Labour government, carried through by the existing coalition government. It was we're now in the process of reassessing one and a half million people. Uh, the people you've grandfathered in your system are now going to be reassessed under our system. Um, because clear, clearly, if you really want to you know, make a difference to those totals, it's the put stock as well as the flow that you've got to pay attention to. And we learned that lesson from the Netherlands, which is the, you know, they went through this process three or four years before we did. We got to the situation where we were just starting in 2010 under, under Labour to grapple with the idea that what we need is a single working age benefit where we get rid of some of the kind of perverse incentives. In the, they're not perverse incentives, but it's really hard to unwind these things. It's, you know, the basic, my perception of the Australian system is you've got the pension system and you've got the allowance system, right? And for all kinds of reasons, you have pensions because that recognises the, the nature of the difficulties that people have and you're trying to help, help people kind of manage those kind of difficulties. The dilemma is a lifetime on is we create kind of weird kind of incentives in the system whereby uh, to get the pension, you've got to show how bad you are, right? Rather than how fit you are. And so, you know, we, we have those similar kinds of problems that we were trying to unravel. And so basically what the legislation in 2010, 2010 did said, what it is is that working age people should basically have the same kind of entitlements. If they've got differences, we should deal with them in a different way, okay? Uh, both in cash terms. Uh, uh, what we want is that anybody in the benefit system uh, should be uh, either preparing for or looking for work. Okay, so the, the differences would be around conditionality, not around the benefit category you actually fall, fall, fell into. And the crude kind of uh, expression was you would have a work ready group, the New Start allows, job seekers allows kind of group are immediately available, have to show they're actively seeking work. A progression to work group, which are people who could be required to engage in work-related activities, attend work-focused interviews, and then a third group, the no-conditionality group, who you would decide, uh, particularly for health reasons, if they've got terminal kind of conditions, would stay outside of the system. So it's a radical kind of change in how you think about the kind of benefit system. Yeah, fine. Okay. Then there was a lot of kind of delivery. <laughs> <laughs> Six minutes. Uh, delivery forms are interesting. I think you know there's a, there's a repository of interesting kind of developments in the UK. You know, again, I've, I've noticed that in the kind of building of Australia's workplace futures, 
I think that's what it's called, right? Balls, wasn't it? That's sorry. <laughs> 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 so, um, but it's uh, it's a bit of a mouthful. But th there's obviously this kind of real emphasis on localism. How do you kind of leverage, uh, uh, you know, uh, the siloed kind of government kind of investments going into an area, make them more flexible and join them up at a kind of local kind of basis? We've had the similar problems in the UK, and we were making some progress to actually dealing with them with things called the city strategies, employment and skill boards. So the repository of things there which I point people to is, you know, again, not things you copy, but just examples of how you might start to think about service delivery in different kinds of ways, or about how you might devolve some of the power that the centre finds it very difficult to give away to allow people to commission things locally rather than to always do it at the kind of centre. The response to the recession, while we get hit by the recession, uh, I think it's very good. Uh, yeah, and these were the kind of key things. First of all, reduce disconnection from work so that we have rapid redundancy services, try and support the apprenticeship system, the kind of things that uh, they are obvious, but they cost a fair bit of money. Crucially, though, this time, um, uh, sorry, yeah, reduce transitions into long term unemployment. So we create you know, basically a job guarantee, particularly for young people, um, minimum wage job, 30 hours a week, that kind of thing. But the crucial thing this time, and it was different to the previous recessions, is we carried on the welfare reform while we're going on. We weren't going to go shift people into inactive benefits, which was the thing the mistake we made in the 80s and 90s, or into early kind of retirement. Uh, Job Centre Plus was incredibly resilient as an organisation, and what we found, slightly to our surprise, but if you look at the evidence from the United States, it's a really powerful one, is the make work pay strategy acted as a good buffer in terms of people not falling back onto the benefit system. So for example, the classic two-parent household, when one wage was lost, they were able through the tax credit system to actually sustain themselves in the, in the workforce in that kind of way. Uh, and the, again, the, the number crunching that's gone on is basically saying that um, the falling unemployment, the GDP fell by about 6% in a two-year kind of period. Unemployment only increased by about 1.6%. Those numbers are far, far better than in previous recessions. The analysis being done on it says about a third of the uh, the unexpected. Uh, okay, basically a, a third of the um, amelioration of the effect. You know, the, the the increased unemployment you would have expected about a third of why it didn't happen was to do with activation reforms and labour market programmes. The rest was to do with labour. You know, employers being slightly different tax credit system and people being actually kept in work and government kind of investment. And what we've now got is this, which is the change composition of workforces. This is a really kind of helpful kind of table. It would be fascinating to see one uh, for the Australian kinds of equivalents. Uh, slight kind of concern here, that the blue line, you know, these are lone parents again, people on disability benefits, the regular unemployed. The blue, blue line are the people who are unemployed but don't get benefits. So one of the concerns is, do all our activation reforms have the effect of shifting people out of the benefit system, but they're still actually looking for work? Now that may be a desirable policy effect anyway, if you want to target your resources more effectively. I think one of the things that's going on there is a lot of full-time students who are looking for work, who get picked up by the kind of uh, things. There's a lot of women who are part of households where, um, because of means testing, they're not eligible for kind of benefit in their own kind of right, but it's a noticeable kind of trend. The other thing that's starting to happen is because of the activation reforms, we're now starting to see the durations of um, job seekers' allowance increase isn't just simply to do with what's happening in the labour market. It's also because we're shifting more difficult to place people back into that active benefit. And whilst it's working for some of them, the low pay rate, employment rate, by the way, continues to increase during the recession, which is a remarkable kind of uh, um, achievement. And I think something to do with the fact of increase, introducing conditionality there. Uh, but you can see we're dealing with uh, a, diff you know, a different combination of events. The three th factors that are going to be shaping, uh, shaping the policy environment in the UK over the next uh, decade are on the one hand the austerity package, um, and this is serious, big, it's both in terms of the benefit system itself, uh, by 2014-15 some of our £18 billion a year will have been taken out of benefit entitlements. And alongside that, we've then got um, large-scale cuts taking place in the public sector. So public servants, like yourselves, are having to get smarter and more efficient, as well as deal with the consequence that colleagues will be um, 
sign him off. I think I thought so. Okay, um, but there's a, again, it's that kind of classic thing. The crisis is provoking really interesting service delivery changes. You know, the shift over to internet-based kind of access to the benefit system uh, is being accelerated because of these kinds of changes which are in a really important way. Universal credit means that basically uh, from 2013, all the flow into the new benefit system will be on this standardised uh, benefit which uh, uh, has some kind of differences within it, but largely is a, a single working age benefit for all people of working age. And gradually over a four year period, everybody will migrate it into this system. So as I say, at the end of 2017, it'll be about 8 million families within the universal credit system. And then finally, we've got our work program and other kind of employment measures to deal with that. Well, some issues. One minute. <laughs> two, two minutes. Okay. So this is the bits that are kind of provocative. I can't believe that they're not, that quite a few of these aren't, you know, already on the agenda here, but they're useful just to kind of put them there. <coughs> First of all, redefining disability benefits. Um, I think it was really important that we decided to go down the ESA route rather than just simply redefine the way our IP system actually worked. We've done that before previously. Because somehow we have to unlock the idea that being found fit for work or fit, capable of some work is a failure, which is the way our system works at the moment. And sorry, from what I see of it, uh, you, a similar kind of lock-in effect in, in the Australian system. And part of that is getting across the idea, and this, this is no easy thing, because it's easy to say it, but to do it is different. But when we're doing work capacity assessments, that they're not saying anything about the fact that you're genuinely ill or you have a genuine health condition. You can have a genuine health condition, you still might be able to work and capable of some work. Now those are two very simple propositions, um, and I think they're a good starting point for thinking about policy and where you want policy to go, uh, but they're really difficult to do. Uh, partly because of entrenched interests, lots of concerns out there in the community about them. Single benefit, there are pros and cons about that. But at the very least, what you need to do is to coordinate activation and participation requirements across your different benefits. Yeah? What we don't want is activation targeted here and welfare, long-term welfare dependency popping up there. Yeah? Or activation tar uh, uh, targeted here and permanent disconnection emerging here. You can go down the American route if you want, which is basically a, a welfare system that basically tells people to go away. Or you can go down a welfare system that actually says, we want to help you get a job. Um, again, activation, this is just, I think this is about design, it's about targeting the right appropriate mix of measures to target the people. And what I'd say when you look at the British system is things like having a tool like the work focused interview as part of the mix of activation measures will be really important, you know, as people make the journey from being out of work or having a, a serious health condition back into the kind of workplace. You don't want to kind of just say you're either permanently sick and completely disabled or you're ready to start work tomorrow kind of thing. You need some intermediate kind of measures. Once you start down the, uh, that route, then that's going to change the, the composition of your new start population. Inevitably, there are going to be people with more difficulties in that group, which means that has challenges for your JSA providers and the kind of uh, the types of interventions they can do, particularly for the long-term uh, new start kind of recipients, which obviously you're starting to get to with the work experience that happens at the end of uh, at the end of the year. Um, could the design of job service Australia be better focused on both on one hand longer term outcomes? It's 13 weeks, 26 weeks at the moment, but a hell of a lot of service fees in your system uh, with some of the consequences that come with that. Uh, and also, is the balance right with Centrelink? You know, our decision was, you know, part of we made a different choice at an earlier stage, but high volume, uh, transactional kinds of systems, the public sector does that really well. You know? <coughs> Why would you load up the people who you want to be flexible in working intensively with clients? Why are you loading them with loads of process requirements that actually stop them doing the things they say they're really good at and some of them are really good at? <laughs> right, so, and finally, uh, clearly we've got to, you know, whilst the work first systems that Australia, the United Kingdom, the US uh, in particular have actually pioneered are really good. We've got away from this idea that there's only so many jobs out there and it's really impossible to get people into a job because we look at labour market flows and there are always vacancies in the economy. Even at the moment, you know, we're getting something like 500,000 job vacancies every quarter notified to Job Centre Plus, even though we've got 
much higher unemployment than we previously had, but we can't be blind to the fact that skill needs are changing and the composition of the workforce is changing over the future. So we need to get smarter about the way we integrate employment and skills. And difficult as it is in the United Kingdom, I think it's even more difficult in Australia because you've got bloody states in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that's me. That's great. That's right. Okay, we're still at the budget time for questions. Could you wait um, for the mic, though, because we're recording this to put it on YouTube? So, first question. Back down. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that um, you were going to be, or that the British government was going to be retesting people on incapacity benefit um, starting from 2011. The people that, that we, that our government has chosen to grandfather. Is there any early data yet about how many people are being judged to, to come off incapacity benefits and onto another payment or, or, or something altogether different? As you can imagine, there's incredible controversy around the nature of the test, mm -hmm. uh, the actual details of it, how it impacts on people with mental health problems, people with fluctuating conditions. There's a, there's a whole real difficult stress uh, thing of uh, stuff going on here. At the moment, there's a bunch of people who sign off when they're actually called into it for the interview. We've had some implementation problems, again, as you can imagine. But uh, the projections are that something like 10% will go into the, um, what we call the support group, which is the unconditional part of the benefit. Uh, about a quarter will go into the uh, work-related activity group. These are the ones that go through the full assessment process, and about 60% have been found fit for work or capable of some work, and they go on to the new start allowance. Because that's, I mean, that's sort of fantastically high rate because here in Australia we do do reviews of people on disability pension but the end result is that very very small percentage of people end up coming off deals. Because you've got the same test. This test is very different to the previous uh, uh, way that you access uh, the benefit system. Can you explain what the test is? Uh, <laughs> there's a big debate going on about whether our test is too functional. It's, um, it's carried out by health professionals and allied health professionals. It's all delivered by a monopoly provider, which I think has been a mistake, which is called Atos Origin, uh, which has screwed up the implementation of it. And essentially, it's kind of, there's a functional kind of uh, set of descriptors, right? Sorry, there's two parts of this. First of all, are you capable of work? Right? Which is then used to discriminate between the support group and the, sorry, I'm going to get myself a kind of job. God, and I'm a bit reluctant to do this, but if you want to speak to me afterwards, I can easily send you the thing, and it's, it's much easier doing it that kind of way. Yeah? But the essential principle is that, you know, are you not fit for, fit for work? Then if you're found not to be fit for work, are you in the activity group or are you in the support group? And it's all subject to an appeal process, which at the moment is getting gummed up because the advocacy organisations have to screw up. Next question. Well, just, just a quick one, and this isn't my area, Dan, but the, obviously 2011 is the first year the baby boomers, by some definition, start to retire. So there's a demographic gain going on when we look particularly at that last graph. Is, and forgive my if I'm naive, but the incapacity benefit, does that stop when you reach statutory pension age, or does it continue? So I just kind of wonder, it stops, so I'm just kind of wondering what the demographic impact on that big thing is. Not really back to them. Uh, no, the, one of the things that's going on in here is that um, in terms of increasing the participation age, mm -hmm. uh, we've got, I'm not sure where Australia is on, on the side, but we're in the process for women of going up from 60 to 65, and then beyond 65, go to 67 working age mm -hmm. by 2020. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the other things that's driving at the moment. What we've got is an increase in participation age around older age groups, which we didn't have for that in the earlier recessions when that, the reverse was taken, taking place. And what we're finding as well, probably to do with how bad our pension system is, is that the post retirement age, the employment rates have been increasing in those groups. Right. Yep, okay. Any other questions? Ah, actually. You were talking about shifting um, payments for employment service providers onto outcomes-based contracts paid for 
out of the savings? Has that actually happened yet? And how does, how does that work? Yeah, it's the contracts that the work program providers have signed up to, signed up to, uh, some of whom are Australian kind of providers, so they're probably lobbying for that quite actively down here at the moment, I should think. But essentially, from the government's point of view, uh, the, the future funding system, in a nutshell, big contracts, they last for a lot longer, so larger, longer, and more secure kind of contracts, but much higher risk for the providers. So that's why the prime providers are primarily for-profit organisations who can take on big risk. So some familiar names from other service uh, delivery parts of the Australian kind of uh, family, so to speak, uh, but who don't do welfare to work, people like Serco, G4S, organisations that are involved in other parts of the public sector uh, are starting to become involved in the welfare to work programs. The funding mechanism basically means that contracts last for five years, uh, people are with the provider for a two year kind of period, including people on disability benefits. Uh, the provider basically gets, uh, for the first couple of years, a £400 attachment fee whenever anybody starts. That's to get the system up and running. Then after that, most of the money depends on, first of all, getting the person into a job for either 13 or 26 weeks. There's no job entry payment, it's a job outcome payment. And then after that, depending on which clients you're working with, you get four weekly sustainment payments for keeping them into, in jobs for up to two years. So the smart bit of the design, and this has been argued through with the Treasury, is that that funding model is attached then to minimum levels of performance in each contract area, which says that you've got to deliver more than what would, what would have happened if you weren't kind of intervening. So there's a net benefit to government, and basically you're only being paid on the basis of the benefit savings we know we're actually accruing. So in the first two years, this program in the UK has actually been funded by the providers. The public sector is probably going to have to pay five years down the road for this, but all the startup risk, apart from that £400 attachment fee, is at the moment being borne by the provider. The big politics in the UK is what happens when they start to knock on the minister's door and say, by the way, we've got that money. Uh, it's not quite what we anticipated when we signed up to those performance targets in the first place. But that's the model. So it's, as a funding model, you know, it's a, a, a fairly smart combination of classic PFI model um, with, for the first time, unlocking future benefit savings, but doing it in a way that certainly on paper is rigorous. We get to see and practice what happens. Okay, one more question before we end, or? And I get a drink. Yeah. One more, okay. <laughs> Three flat <flat-to-base> to basically. <laughs> Um, I guess in the last few years we've seen an emphasis on um, attaining a year 12 or you know, finishing secondary school in Australia as a sort of you know capacity building um, exercise for young people and I saw on the weekend there's some announcements about a similar kind of earn or learn initiative in the UK. Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So both or? I know one and the other, that's fine. Okay, um, yeah, the, um, the last Labour government has already enacted that we will be going to a, a compulsory participation age of 18 years. <coughs> so um, what you've seen is slightly different to that, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. But in terms of 17 and 18 year olds, uh, from 2013, the participation age goes up to 17, sorry, to 17. yeah. And then from 2015, it goes up to 18. And it's a participation age, so a bit like here, you know, you wouldn't be forcing people to stay at school. We know where that could go uh, quite, uh, quite quickly, but you will be requiring them to be engaged in um, uh, a minimum amount of training each week or engaged in full-time education. The trend has been going that way now, anyways. Over 94%, I think it is, of 16-year-olds in full-time education and it's about 72% of 17 year olds in full-time education at the moment. Um, so that will accelerate, and that's already enacted, and the coalition government has committed to do that as well. The coalition government took away a number of supports for 16 and 17 year olds as part of the austerity package, but I won't particularly go down that road. Um, the Erna Lam thing, Ian Duncan Smith was out here recently, our Secretary of State for Employment, so undoubtedly saw Earn and Learn, which is why we've got that in our package. <laughs> and basically it's the first package uh, of measures, partially reintroducing some of the things that have already been cut, 
that the big panic was that um, last week the number of young unemployed people topped a million people. So they needed to have a, a, an emergency kind of response. And it's called a thing called the youth contract. Uh, so basically it's got after nine months unemployment, people will be man mandated to kind of engage with, and this goes up to 25, it will be 18 to 25 to so focus on really. The under 18s, then it's gonna be full-time participation uh, and we're seeing an expansion of the apprenticeship system for that kind of group, as well as full-time routes in further education colleges and in uh, schools. Thanks, uh, last question. Yeah, this question's on youth unemployment as well. I read an article in The Guardian recently about um, young unemployed people through the um, Job Centre Plus um, volunteering for work, for, um, volunteering for work experience with large supermarket chains and then working for 30 hours plus a week and if they with no pay at all other than continuing receiving their benefits and it was a condition of um, continued receipt of their benefits that they continued to provide free labour to these large supermarket chains and I was wondering whereabouts that fits into everything you've spoken about and whether that's an accident or <laughs> it's, it's meant to happen. Well okay, basically they're called them internships. Lots of middle class kids do it already. Yeah. Uh, they work for nothing to become lawyers uh, for a year and that gets exploited as well, kind of thing. So there's an exploitation thing going on there. It's a classic Guardian story, right? There's a German truth in it and they've seized on it to kind of make it <laughs> the, the interesting policy tool is a thing called uh, work trials, which previously were restricted to two weeks. And I think that's where they should start, yeah? So basically part of saying to an employer, take a risk on this person, to the person, take a risk on this job, for two weeks you can do it, you don't have to be actively seeking work, uh, you don't have to come off benefit, you know, that big risk of kind of coming off benefit, and to the employer, just try the person out, if they turn up, then, you know, give them a go, at get them the kind of job. Usually we tie this in with the idea of a guaranteed job interview at the end of the kind of thing. Uh, unwisely, I think, uh, that's now been extended to up to eight weeks because our ministers seem to think that middle class internship model could be rolled out through our Job Centre Plus kind of system. Um, I doubt if anybody would be sanctioned in the way that the Guardian kind of suggested because the moment you appealed it, it would break down. You know, just we do have a due, due process kind of set of kind of constraints on these kinds of things. But you're right, it's a, you know, it's a really kind of worrying kind of element to it. Uh, and it actually kind of corrupts actually what's actually quite good idea, you know, the idea of work trials. I'm sure in the Australian system there must be an equivalent uh, kind of work trial kind of thing to it. Um, but yeah, so um, middle class ministers should think outside the box of it. Okay, well, thanks. We've got a small, I'm sure it's not an umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, thanks very much.